Hey guys, this is Joe with GotBaseballCards.com coming to you live from our retail location in Loganville, Georgia. Today we premiere the first episode of Sports Card Collecting for Dummies. Uh, this is a series I have thought about for a long time. It's a way that we want to help educate novices, young collectors, and even some advanced collectors who uh, may not be familiar with all aspects of the hobby. Today we're going to talk about um, kind of the mass produced years in the baseball card hobby, late 80s to early 90s. If you've owned a baseball card store for more than a day, you've probably received a phone call asking someone to sell you their late 80s and early 90s baseball cards. I have received thousands and thousands of phone calls with that question. And sadly, that era was mass produced. I'm going to give you a little backstory. I was a collector beginning in 1976. So I saw a lot of changes in the hobby. Uh, in the early 80s, the hobby was really taking off. I remember uh, there, was a, there was a fever pitch in 1984. People were chasing Don Mattingly rookie cards, especially the Donruss followed by the Fleer. Um, and then production continued to be ramped up by the companies. Uh, and then we hit uh, the real just explosion of production uh, which historically we look back on as being around 1987 through 1992 were probably the most mass produced years. As you see in front of me here, I have a number of boxes from our retail store here in Loganville. And uh, this is a, just, just a handful of some of the 80s and 90s boxes we have in stock. I sold all of these products when they first came out. Um, we've got, you know, 89 Donruss with Griffey Rookies, 91 Stadium Club, 88 Score with Glavin Rookies, 91 Donruss that had the first, uh, had, had elite uh, inserts, um, 89 Tops, uh, still, still had the gum back then, uh, 90 Upper Deck, Sosa Rookies, and Second Year Griffies, and so forth. Um, the thing is, most of these products were so heavily produced. As I talk to young collectors today, I try to help explain to them that products from the late 80s and early 90s, as a general rule, were probably produced at 500 to 1,000 times the amounts of products produced today. I don't know the exact numbers, I'm giving you a ballpark because we get so many calls, so many calls with people trying to sell us their late 80s, early 90s collections. And just to give you an idea, our shop opened in 1991 <clears throat> and we were already selling a lot of these late 80s boxes. And uh, even like when 90 Upper Deck came out, we sold this product very well, you know, at $35 a box. You can buy these now in our store for $15 a box. Many of these others, same thing, they were $20, $25 a box when they came out. Many of these you can walk into our store now and buy them for $10 a box. And so we occasionally get calls offering us to sell us cases of these products. And usually we have plenty of them on hand already. We, we'll always make an offer on cases of unopened product, but they're worth far less today than the day they first hit the street. And so uh, it's very confusing sometimes because people will call me and I tell them that we do buy older collections and they say, oh yeah, I've got some early 90s cards. And my running joke is if it's not older than me, it's not really old. I was born in 1968. So if it's not back in the early 60s or older, it's not stuff we're actively chasing, though we do buy collection from the 70s. And we'll cover that in another, another video. But I did want to uh, educate collectors a little bit about the late 80s, early 90s, because even though the great majority of products produced back then were, were mass produced and they're still available in large supplies, there are a handful of cards, a handful of sets from that time period that we actively pursue that are very hard to find on the marketplace. Now, this is not a catch-all video. I'm not gonna go through every last set and product produced in the late 80s and early 90s, but I do wanna hit some of the highlights and let collectors know there is some gold still to be found among the rubbish of the mass-produced cards from those years. Uh, first of all, uh, I guess one of the most well-known is the 1989 Upper Deck series. This was their premier series. This is an unopened box of the low series. I remember uh, from the day these came out, they changed the face of collecting. This is a sealed box from Baseball Card Exchange that certifies unopened boxes. Um, this product had the Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card, which was the hottest card in the product 
from the day it came out and always has been ever since. Uh, these, we retail these in our store for $150 a box for the low series, and they were around $35 a box when they came out. So um, they have taken off a lot, you know, over the, that time period. Whereas other products from the, that same year are now worth less than they were when they came out. Here we have an example of a PSA 9 graded Ken Griffey Jr. Rookie, number one, star rookie number one in the set. This changed the face of collecting as Upper Deck was working on anti-counterfeit technology, which was very prevalent in the late 80s. They introduced adding a hologram to the back of the card to protect counterfeiters from copying the, uh, the card. So they put an Upper Deck hologram on the back of the card. So... Um, Another uh, another set from the late 80s that you rarely ever see, I don't even have one in front of me, but they were only produced in set form, and that is the Topps Tiffany sets. Ken Griffey had a 1989 Topps Tiffany card in the traded set, which is a highly sought after card. Those were high gloss cards produced by Topps uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, they stopped with the 1991 set, uh, but the 91 Chipper Jones Tiffany rookies very sought after. Uh, the 89 Topps Traded Griffey is very sought after. All of your key rookies from the late 80s, early 90s have significant demand for their Tiffany cards because if I remember correctly, most of those were produced quantities of about 5,000 or fewer sets. As you uh, look at other products from 1991, here's one we often get called about, and that's the 1991 Desert Shield cards. This series, very limited, was only released, or was only supposed to be released, to troops serving, servicemen serving in Desert Shield. I once bought a complete set from someone who had actually served uh, during, uh, in 1991. This is a PSA graded Fred McGriff card, and if you notice, if I hold the card like this, it looks no different than any other 1991 Topps card. However, notice the Desert Shield logo at the top of the card, which makes all the difference. These packs, you rarely ever see these. They look like 91 Tops packs, but every card in them has Desert Shield cards. Here's another example of a PSA graded Carlton Fisk. And one of the reason we all one of the reasons we always get our stars from this series professionally graded is because there are a number of counterfeits. This was regular top stock and people created their own little stamps and would, could counterfeit these cards. So uh, I always highly recommend buying uh, PSA, BGS, or uh, SGC graded uh, cards on Desert Shield. From that set, the most sought after card, of course, is the 1991 Chipper Jones Rookie Desert Shield uh, in a PSA 10 is worth several thousand dollars. The last one we had was a nine that we sold back at the National a couple years ago and wish we had that one back. So again, that is another great set to look for in the early 90s, uh, especially if you had uh, friends or family that served in the military overseas uh, during Desert Shield, they could very well possibly have obtained some of those. Um, as we move up later into the early 90s, uh, another very pr prominent popular set is the 1993 Upper Deck SP series. Don't have any boxes of it, it's a very sought after box, but the key card to that set is the 1993 SP Derek Jeter rookie card. This is a BGS graded eight version. Has a nice shot of Jeter on the back as well. Jeter, of course, is one of the most collected ball players out there. Uh, and all of his rookie cards from 1993 are popular, but this, the 93 SP number 279, is the most sought after. And it's incredibly tough and high grade. Uh, I remember just recently a PSA 10 uh, I believe sold in the neighborhood of $100,000. So incredibly rare in high grade. Uh, but that series is very sought after. This card is the, uh, I would say this is the most sought after, uh, by far this is the most sought after Jeter rookie, and it's one of the most sought after cards from the 1990s. Of course, there were even some Jeter. Here's another example of a, a brand that didn't have a lot of value. This came up in 1994, Signature Rookies but they did have a Derek Jeter autograph. So if you have some signature rookies cards laying around, you better check them. You never know. There could be a Jeter autograph stuck in yours. 
as he did sign 8,650. So there were a lot of these produced. Uh, one of the most confusing, there's a couple of different products from the early 90s that are very confusing that we get calls about all the time. We often get calls where people call me and tell me they have a lot of old, old cards um, and they start quoting the years to me. And they say, I've got some cards from 1904, 1928, 1939, 1916. So my first question is always, are they black and white? And most of the times they are. Because in 19, in the early 90s, there was a, pro a product made by Mega Cards called the Conlon Collection. And what these were, they used old sporting news photographs of ball players and produced cards that would show when, when these photos were made, which was also during the time period when they played. Here's a few Hall of Famers for you. Jimmy Fox, Hannes Wagner, Walter Johnson, Bob Feller, Christy Mathewson. And note, these cards have years on the front. So we often get phone calls with customers saying they have cards from this time period. So I always ask them, of course, are they black and white? And then I encourage them to look at the backs of the cards, which in small print, we're not going to be able to catch this on camera, but there's a copyright day at the very bottom, copyright 1991 for this Christy Mathewson, which was in the first series. This is an unopened box of the product from 1993, which, you know, you could get several hundred of these black and white cards in every box. So again, that, that's one that's very confusing for young collectors when they, uh, or, or it could be collectors of any age when they come across these because they appear to be vintage cards. One rule of thumb is when you're buying vintage cards, if they have years on them, especially printed on the front like that, it's, I can almost guarantee you they were not printed those years because very, very few products in the teens, 20s, and 30s had any years on them because many of them were produced over multiple years. Even the most historic tobacco card set, the uh, T206 set, was printed from 1909 through 1911. So it's very rare to see anything from the, the teens, 20s, 30s, that actually had the year on them from when they were produced. Another of our most confusing products is the 1993 Topps Archive Series, which they also did in 1994. We get calls on this one all the time where people tell us they have some Jim Mint condition 1953 Topps cards. And as you can see right out of our warehouse, here are a few 1953 Topps archives. The way to tell the difference, the 1953 regular series, first of all, were larger in size. These are standard two and a half by three and a half size. The, the original 1953s were larger in size and they also didn't have a glossy finish. And to add to the confusion, the backs looked the same, except to clarify it, the archives said, Topps Baseball Archives, the ultimate 1953 series. So again, that uh, collectors often call in uh, and think they have some original 1953 Topps cards, but in fact, this may be all they have. So again, that's uh, one of the other popular products from the from the 90s uh, that was a look back and uh, a reproduction of 1953 Topps. Topps again did that in 1994, where they uh, did an archive series of 1954. So. Uh, again, if you have a lot of 80s and 90s cards, uh, as I try to educate customers who come in with them to sell, um, you can buy a lot of those in bulk for, for pennies on the dollar, less than pennies on the dollar, because so many were mass produced. However, there are some, some, some really nice finds out there. Uh, we do actively buy products like the 89 Upper Deck. We buy cases of 1990 Leaf. We obviously look for 1991 Desert Shield. 1993 SP, um, also in 1993, another highly sought after set. Don't have one in front of me, but it's the 1993 Topps Finest, which was uh, new technology for them. It was the first chromium type card for baseball cards. Um, and they had the first ever refractor cards. So remember the first day a customer educated me on what those were. Uh, it was one of the first very popular parallel inserts, the 93 Finest Refractors, still highly sought after as 
Uh, they believe uh, only uh, roughly 240 or so of each were produced and some were more short printed than that. But that's a very sought after set. So again, there are cards from the late 80s, early 90s with value. So don't give up if that's all you've got in your collection. But you do have to dig deep sometimes. Uh, so so uh, just wanted to uh, try to provide a little bit of insight to those years because those are critical years because the hobby really exploded in the late 80s and early 90s. Millions of collectors poured into the hobby, uh, but millions of cards were produced as well. So uh, again, there are some golden nuggets out there. It just takes some digging to find them. So if you locate some 93 SP Jeters, let us know. If you locate some 91 Tops Desert Shield, let us know. And of course, we always buy Griffey Rookies, and, and, uh, and we do always buy cases of this product, even the low-end stuff. There's always, there's always a level of demand because people love to open packs. So we appreciate you tuning in. Again, this is the first in our Sports Card Collecting for Dummies series. You're welcome to message us, us with uh, your questions, your comments, and your requests. Uh, I've been blessed to be a part of this hobby for over 30 years, and uh, really more than that as a collector, but been, been a part of the hobby itself for over 30 years now. And uh, I'm happy to educate other retailers, happy to educate young collectors, uh, collectors young and old. And uh, so if we can provide any advice for you and uh, advise you on how to more um, wisely, you know, how to spend your money more wisely on collections, be glad to help you out any way we can. Uh, so again, you can uh, follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash gotbaseballcards. Uh, check us out on our website, gotbaseballcards.com, and come by our retail store in Loganville, Georgia. Thanks so much, guys, and we will see you next time.